the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Welcome to WTF Saturday, where we talk about interesting things that hopefully matter to us, citizens of the United States. <laughs> um, joining us from the studio is John, our wonderful tech guy and uh, amazing propagator of all this amazing content. Um, and we have Dirk in his wooden cabin, <laughs> <laughs> and Tali in her sound booth from an undisclosed location. And <laughs> also a wooden cabin. And a wooden cabin. And Ariel and I are here as well. And we soon will have joining us Antonia Capelli, who is a uh, amazing person and who helped decriminalize uh, psychedelics here in Santa Cruz County. And she'll be joining us when she's when she pops on. So And one hell of a DJ. Oh yeah, that's cool too. So to start the day, uh, Tali has a cool story she wants to share with us. <laughs> um, it's definitely not a cool story. Okay, it's never mind. A story. <laughs> <laughs> the story. All right. I guess I'll call this story my friend Rob. And uh, Dirk and John, or anybody who knows where I'm going with this one, uh, no spoilers, please. So. Um, <laughs> a lot can happen in a week. Uh, <laughs> um, so I don't know. I'll start here, I guess. Start from the beginning. Does anybody know what a public administrator does? Okay. I know so the let's, story. Let's start at the beginning then, I guess. Um, a lot of people don't know what that job is, and it's pretty, like, low down on the totem pole, I guess. People don't know who's running generally. They don't know what they do. Public administrator deals with things that are left behind when people die and don't have somebody, like, don't have a, a next of kin or something listed and or don't have one at all. And they're probably going to deal with your RV or something like that, um, but they might end up dealing with a person. Maybe the decedent took care of of a like a, a handicapped person, and there's not somebody to take that on. This mm. is somebody who would have to decide where that person is going to go and how they're cared for. So it's actually a really important job, and it's something that. I've cared about ever since I found out what they actually do. Hmm. So last election cycle for that, I was on the panel that did the interviews for that for my previous show, the organization that did my previous show. So anyway, um, there were two Republicans running, like this was primary season, and there were two Republicans running and one Democrat. One of the Republicans showed up and the Democrat showed up. And I was impressed that he showed up because he wasn't running against anybody at the moment. Um, and the, one, the, the uh, Republican who didn't show up really like was not campaigning, hadn't put anything out there. Like we couldn't even find a photo of this person. But the other Republican who was running um, was accused of rape. He, he was a corrections officer at one point at the uh, juvenile detention center and was accused of raping a pregnant teenage inmate. And so I thought that was kind of a big deal, especially if you're running for an office where you are going to deal with people who, like, can't can't really take care of themselves. And the job basically calls for some empathy. Right. And, yeah, that and, seems and bad. And trustworthiness. Like, we need to trust you to take care of people who 
can't make decisions for themselves and can't take care of themselves. And um, he'd been convicted of like a slight, some like like he pled down to something slightly lower and then over the years like kept pleading it down but was still convicted of something awful. And so anyway, I brought that up during the uh, during the panel and I still had a, like a slightly difficult time talking the other guys on the panel into um, into uh, selecting the Democrat to uh, to whatever. Um, I can't think of words right now. But anyway, uh, we selected the Democrat and I really liked him. And John, we had him on the other show. I don't know if you remember him, but um, anyway, uh, there's a lot more to that story, but that's not totally relevant. During all of this time, though, um, like he became a friend of mine. Wait, which guy? The rapist uh, the, guy? No, the, the, de the Democrat. I'm sorry. Okay. The Democrat. Yeah. Glad um, to hear it. Yes, the, the Democrat. His name is Rob Tayus. And uh, he seemed like a really nice guy. And we became friends. Um, he became friends with friends of mine. Did and he win the election? He did win the election. I went to his uh, victory party. It was the victory party, I think, that I stayed at the longest that year. Um, his, like, I met his whole family. Oh. Um, his, his mom cooked for us. It was great. Um, I'm so curious now. Like, like, did he do something really good or I met, really bad? I met really the, bad. The, the whole family, and um, he became friends with my friends. Like I said, he became sort of the guy that, like, my reporter friends actually hung out with at, at events and stuff. And um, anyway, um, last week, John was talking about somebody who he's been talking to who is running for, um, for uh, public administrator. And I didn't say anything, but I thought, like, that's interesting. I wonder who this person that's running is. And I wonder, um, like, is did Rob decide not to run? I wonder what's going on and with this is that. in Las Vegas, and, election, local. Yeah, and it's... it's uh, Clark County. Okay. Yeah, it's Clark County. And I just, I wondered, like, is he not running? Why is he not running? But I didn't bring it up. Like, I, I didn't feel like that was really important for the show. So anyway... Um, Do tell. <laughs> What a difference a week makes. Um, uh, Alan actually asked me, there was there was a reporter in Las Vegas who was murdered, and uh, Alan asked me if I knew this person, and I don't. As somebody who works at the R, or worked at I know the RJ. Who he is. And, Jeff um, German. Uh, German. Um, Jeff German. I didn't know him, and he's a he's thought, a fairly famous local uh, right but i didn't know him that... and so i like i just said no and right. went on with my day and then um a couple of days ago i guess it, i saw another i saw an article uh probably like a national news article and they were at rob tayas house um poking around and then later that day they arrested him and um i mean they've got his car dna evidence like shoes and and on and on and so he murdered this reporter saw him come back home and he had on almost like a hazmat suit on right which just means that they took your car. clothes yeah. uh, like they took your clothes to to look for whatever um anyway <laughs> anyway it's he's been accused of of murdering this reporter and it doesn't it definitely doesn't look good um this reporter had been uh running articles that that painted him in a bad light is what they said 
It wasn't so, just a bad light. It was it was a pretty terrible light because apparently he was having affairs with somebody and he was doing some, some pretty bad malfeasance kind of stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, well, he, he, he did run, but he lost his primary and and then this happened. So, um, so that was my. <laughs> yeah. So, how does it feel like someone that you knew well and trusted and felt like was a nice human being is now potentially a murderer? How yeah, does that that's feel? a lot to sort of. It's an interesting thing to wrap your mind around. Yeah, I bet. Well, I lost a bet because of this, because I bet myself that based on the things he was accused of and the thing, the, the unhinged way he went after the reporter that was was reporting on him, and he never denied the things that the reporter said were, were false. He just felt like he was being persecuted for some reason. But because of all those things, I kept thinking to myself, this guy's got to be like a MAGA type individual to go that off because his reporter's reporting on him and then he goes to his house and kills him hang on I've, but uh, it's not no no he's not i mean maybe he's clearly i has a uh, some mental illness maybe or i don't know i feel like crimes of passion i mean you're a you know police ex-police officer dirk i mean do you feel like i mean i, I feel like people act the most irrational around like love and accusations and trying to hide secrets i feel like like lo like when love and like romance and cheating and like all that stuff is involved people start to act more nuts well i think it's interesting because he actually he lost his primary in june so okay. like it didn't matter really, it's like, like personal like, right it, it was personal maybe well, yeah I it mean, just seems peculiar because his he reputation lost. was being besmirched i guess if you, if you want to call it that Oh, I but know. I've suddenly it actually sounds to me a lot like somebody who really quiet Thank is you. really upset over being exposed. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Not that I, not, it doesn't, I didn't get the feel for him being innocent. I got the feel for him being upset that he was getting exposed. And this guy, this reporter was relentless and wouldn't let him slink off into the sunset. So. And it's, it's well, I don't think that he, I, I, I didn't I don't think that the reporter was continuing to go after him. I could be wrong. Well, he kept he, I, I saw some of the um, the posts that he made on either Twitter or Facebook or whatever it was. And he was he would make all kinds of comments about uh, his wife heard some noise out in the backyard in the trash. And he told her, he says, don't worry about it. It's not wild animals. It's Jeff German going through our garbage can looking for more evidence, you know, stuff like that. So he, he was always making these snide comments. It sounds like, yeah, he, yeah, this, he didn't like, like th this guy, like he had like a personal deep grudge against this guy and I guess thought he could get away with it, which. Well, the, and the reason why I lost the bet was because, um, without looking at more of his background, because I just saw the stuff that they posted in the news, and I just, because I, I knew Jeff German, and um, I didn't, I, I wasn't close with him, but I knew who he was and what he had done, and I was kind of familiar with his body of work. And um, I just found it amazing that he just kept, he was so mad about him posting these, these reports, but he never really denied whether the things actually happened or not. And that to me is that that's so typical that that Christian I think he denied right the affair. Type, huh? I think he denied the affair, but like that one, who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously yeah, his wife just... cares. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, but like otherwise, like, why would we care? All right, we have uh we have uh Athonia uh is wanting to come in. All right, let's let her in. So that's uh, that that's a mind blower. So I I got to be more careful on who I invite as guests on the show. I guess. Well, you just never know who's going to be a uh, turn up to be a murderer. I guess anything's possible. That was a great lead-in for my friend Athonia. I know. Yeah. <laughs> right. Cool. So, uh, 
I don't know if you guys all saw the news, but on September 6th, uh, San Francisco decriminalized entheogenic plants, um, which is really exciting. Entheogenic substances, not just plants. Uh, I believe it was actually specifically plants or plant-based. Plants, fungi, and natural materials that can inspire personal and spiritual well-being, which includes psilocybin, ayahuasca, DMT, ibogaine, and more. Um, it's pretty amazing. Um, and I think those, in, uh, in the measure, like, um, and I feel like this is really important, and I think what we can talk about today, too, substance abuse, addiction, recidivism, trauma, PTSD oh. symptoms, chronic depression, anxiety, grief, diabetes, headaches, and other conditions are plaguing the community. The use of entheogenic plants and fungi have been shown to be beneficial to the health and well-being of individuals and communities in addressing these afflictions via scientific and clinical studies and within continuing traditional practices which can catalyze profound experiences of personal and spiritual growth. Joining us to share about her experience with this is Anthonia, one of Ariel's dear friends, and we're all happy to meet you. I'm Welcome happy. to our show. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is Athonia Capelli, um, A T H O N I A, and uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for the invite. Um, this is pretty momentous uh, news about San Francisco. Thank you for joining us so last minute. After that, I apologize. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> thanks for the invite, Ariel. Um, and for those who don't know, the term entheogenic um, comes from entheogen, so that which engenders a sacred uh, state, which is a little bit more of a respectful term than, well, a more specific term than just psychedelic, um, which I think to a lot of people still has the connotation of psycho. Yes, so, okay. I just, before we, before we let her get started, I just want to make one point. I, I find it absolutely fascinating that we spend so much time and effort trying to keep things like this illegal and not really delving into the um, historical value that other people have found over the years for, for these kinds of things. Uh, marijuana, um, ayahuasca, all, all, the, all this stuff. And yet, we still have alcohol legal, and yeah. it causes more damage than just about any of that stuff. And it's known to cause damage. And so I just I just find that fascinating that something that actually might have beneficial properties is being up until now illegal and alcohol is OK. I, I have it's a friend who's running for sheriff in another part of the country. Um, he's, he's the chief deputy there now and the sheriff is retiring and he's being endorsed to take his place. And we were talking yesterday about um it, it it's always been kind of a joke that cops have the best drugs <laughs> and uh so it, in in this state the state that i'm talking about uh marijuana is uh authorized for medicinal use but not for recreational and he was saying they keep trying to get it done you know but something always happens and he said, I would much rather, he said, I would love to see it legalized. He said, I have never had a problem arresting or, or having a problem with, you know, somebody who's smoking pot. But he said, that Jim Beam tequila and all that other <laughs> crap, he goes, nothing but trouble. And he goes, I, I just don't understand why, you know, the, the powers that be don't get that. So. Yeah, I mean, I think Biden just recently is potentially considering in their administration federally decriminalizing marijuana, um, which would be fantastic. And I think it's, you know, Anthony and Athonia, excuse yeah. me. Yeah, sh I think you might have a lot to say about this, but things moving in the direction towards legalizing um, these really helpful um, substances. Sure. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of things. I mean. Yeah, federally, you know, in, you know, nationally, I think that's going to be a long time if, if ever. But um, we were getting close in California with a state bill uh, by a state um, senator, uh, Wiener. And he um, he was actually trying to, in his bill, trying to decriminalize all psychedelics. So not just entheogens, entheogens being either plant or naturally occurring uh, uh, psychedelics, which would include like uh, 
five meo DMT, which comes from a, a toad, um, and then and then you know there's also some psychedelics that come from frogs. Those are kind of problematic because you do have to they don't kill the animal in the process, but they do have to sort of they have to kind of um, antagonize the animals so that, so that it puts out um, a bit of the, the the venom that is is of course active. So he was trying to uh, decriminalize like everything, including ketamine and um, you know, other things that are laboratory, that come from laboratories, which would be like LSD, um, uh, 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 MDMA, 2CB. So, so that was pretty interesting, but that seems to have hit a little bit of a bump in the road and he's going to reintroduce it next year. So that's, that's on the state level. That would be, we would be, we would be the first state who ever pulled off something like that. So I was really, um, thrilled to see it get as far as it did. Um, but what I would say for you know a lot of the listeners for this to this podcast, uh, if you would like to do the same type of thing in, in your city, like if you would like to see it decriminalized in, in your township, uh, like the way San Francisco did and Oakland and Santa Cruz, um, we already have the, a written measure that you don't really have to, you don't have to create this verbiage from scratch. Uh, and the way you get to that measure is through a group called uh, Decriminalize Nature and they're also a larger group is called Decriminalize USA. So it's just best to just kind of search for those words. Um, and then uh, there's a, a Larry Plazola is the the head of that group. And he's he was extremely helpful to me when we brought the measure uh, to Santa Cruz City Council. And so all it, all it means to when you want to pass this locally, if you have a city council, like if you're an, I think what's called an incorporated city um, and you actually have like a seven person city council, usually the mayor is on that um, that list. Um, all you have to do is call them, you know, get their names from the city website, call them and ask for an in-person meeting. And they will usually, you're a constituent, so they're going to want to take that meeting with you. And then you show them this completed measure that you're bringing. Uh, and then they don't have that much work to do. They just then have to kind of push it through this redlining process, which means they might cut out pieces or change pieces. Um, and then, you know, it's pretty simple from there. They just put it through. So if you make it as simple as possible uh, for your Congress or for your, I should say, your council critters, um, they they will probably back you up. I mean, we passed it here unanimously. Uh, my understanding is in San Francisco, the supervis supervisors there passed it unanimously. So this can be done relatively easily, in my opinion. Thanks for your hard work on that. Oh, well, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think we're all... Grateful, or at least I am. I think, you know, these things are really beneficial for people's lives, for healing, and I think for our society, it's kind of a big part of what, what I think can help help us through these times ahead that are going to be challenging and difficult, and kind of like having a societal level healing. And, and I, I I think that this is part of the way. Um, yeah, it's so exciting. And I, I wonder, you know, and. Do you feel like the research, like that part of it is just that there's so much more research coming back and like out there now that is supporting really like the so many of the benefits for, you know, it's like a, there's just, you know, no, pretty much not a lot of negatives and a lot of good research at this point or? Absolutely. Um, you know, Johns Hopkins uh, did their sort of famous study uh, using psychedelics to treat people with PTSD. Uh, MAPS, who uh, is right up the street from me, they're the Multidisciplinary Association, Association for Psychedelic Studies. Yes, it just rolls right off the tongue. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> they, you know, they were founded in 84 and they are, they are terrific. Um, um, Doblin, who's the, the founder, uh, he was just, he just spoke at Burning Man this year and he has, you know, they have slightly different views um, as far as decriminalization because they want to see all drugs legalized and they won't, they're not going to stop at anything short of that. So oddly enough, MAPS is not really supportive. They don't get involved in the decrim effort. It doesn't mean that they're not uh, happy that it's happening, but uh, th like I said, they have a different goal and, um, and they've had a lot of success. So for them, the clinical trials are totally legal and they don't want to go back from that. So I understand but um, also, if you look at MAPS and what they've done in terms of using uh, MDMA to treat people with PTSD, to treat people who have, uh, you know, relationship struggles, um, all types of things. And, you know, what that looks like just briefly is usually there's a, you know, a comfy room with a couch 
and you have your subject or maybe two subjects if it's like a couple. Um, and then you have a, usually a male and a female um, psychiat psychiatrist, psychologist, I'm not sure what, what their, what their uh, credentials have to be, but they work together with that, that person or that group um, and maybe for just two or three times to come to some sort of resolution and it's often very successful. So I think to your point, that's what, that's what we're seeing and that's what's also making this more accepted. Maybe one other item that's making it more accepted is like Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind. And he has a, a Netflix series too uh, that only had four episodes originally, but they just did a fifth episode that spe specifically speaks to the, um, the decriminalization effort in these munis municipalities. Um, so that's actually worth watching uh, that fifth one. They sort of show some of the reaction to the decriminalization that happens. So it's it's worth it's worth uh, checking out. Um, so yeah, I think that's those are three things that have uh, moved us forward and maybe reduce the stigma of, around uh, plant based psychedelics. So I, I I have a question, and that is, you know, you're talking about the city or county level uh, to get this started. And, and if it is approved by the city, does that override any of the state uh, laws or regulations? Or no, so, how, no, how, is so, that, how is that affected by uh, state and federal laws? Yeah, so usually the, the city has, the city takes precedence over the county, but so it doesn't affect the county at all, other than you know they may elect to sort of follow those, um, you know, the, the measure, even though it wasn't, Part of the county so i would say you know i don't think there's been a county so far i think we have six or seven cities that successfully decriminalized in the last two years you know around the country i don't i don't think any of them were actually counties because that's a whole different that's a whole different animal um and i don't, honestly don't know what it would take to to do this on a county level well do you feel like what, there's... What, what i'm asking is that the the state or federal or county uh laws don't supersede or the city supersedes those laws? So I think the county would, could supersede like a, the, the city's, no, I'm sorry. So it's usually the, it's usually the, the lowest common denominator, which would be, you know, this, the city is not, their rules are not superseded by the, by the counties. And just, just so you understand, this is decriminalization. So it's not really, it's not legalization. By decriminalization, what that means is, let's say they, Let's say a police officer from, let's say Santa Cruz, pulls you over, and what you know, and they they decide they have a warrant, they decide to search your trunk, and let's say they find, you know, bags and bags of psilocybin mushrooms, they essentially would not have any budget to to track to tr uh, to to prosecute you or to now if you also had, uh, you know, scheduled drugs such as um, you know ketamine or or other other synthetic drugs, uh, they then could prosecute you, and they might be able to use the the existence of psilocybin mushrooms on your in your possession against you. But but what they do is it what this measure does is it makes it the lowest priority, and it basically means the police have to do everything else they can on every other thing they're working on before they can uh, you know track down people who are using psychedelic mushrooms or psychedelic uh, plant based medicines. So you just so have to it. make sure you stay within the city limits. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So they've got to do all their paperwork before they can notice anyone smoking a joint. Exactly. <laughs> well, are you right? Or, or consuming uh, Ibogaine or uh, what are some of the more obscure ones? Um, you know, mescaline. I was really happy to mm. see Ibogaine included in that list. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Because I mean, that's that has been so critical in uh, helping people get off of uh, you know, whatever substances they're, they're addicted to. So, you know, I personally have no experience with it, but there's some great, uh, you know, Netflix and um, other shows, maybe on YouTube, about, you know, people healing themselves when they had long-term uh, addictions to methamphetamine or even alcohol. So I'm curious to see where that, where that goes now that it's been decriminalized. A friend of mine got, uh, managed to kick his opiate addiction that had destroyed his life for many years with Ibogaine and uh, now committed his life to working with it to help other addicts. That's true, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think the... Which kind of goes back to my original point. I, I'm just absolutely fascinated with how they keep trying to criminalize all this stuff when it also 
has shown so many positive aspects of its usage and helping other people with other things that they consider dangerous. It just it just makes no sense. Yeah. It, it, well, it, I mean, the alcohol lobby. Well, I yeah. also think it's like farm. I mean, I would imagine as far as you know, I'm a RL and I both are healthcare providers. We're acupuncturists and Chinese medicine practitioners. Um, and it's, you know, what you kind of see from the pharmaceutical industry and medical lobbyists is like they want drugs that they can um, patent and sell to make money. And so a lot of these things are plants and they grow naturally and you don't have to buy them from a pharmacist. No one's making a profit. And if they're actually, as research is starting to show, going to potentially help you um, help you mentally and maybe get you off of other addicted substances. Like I worked in an Ibogaine clinic for a short while in Mexico um, doing acupuncture as like a adjunct therapy for people that were going through Ibogaine treatment. And it was just beautiful to see what people were experiencing, like the transformative life-changing experience. And then also the complete relief of their withdrawal symptoms. Um, you know, and it just was like us kind of having a spiritual experience with an entheogenic plant, as well as being relieved from like the suffering of symptoms of withdrawal and then having a supportive um, health center to really help them get through integrating it into changing their lifestyle. Um, there's huge potential to help people with addiction. And I've also had friends go through rehab in the States where you pretty much go and you stay for a month and they get you addicted to other drugs potentially that um, aren't really helping. And the um, you know, the rate at which people go back into rehab over and over here pretty much says that our rehab programs don't really work and they don't so really help people in the long run. So basically what that was a very elegant way of saying follow the money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's like people have, I think people do have power, you know, and a lot of what we talk about on this show often is just, you know, how we can get involved in politics to create change for people. And really, if, if we take action, we can do, th do things to nudge government in the direction of things that we'd like as the, popu as the population and as the potential like majority. And I think that um, really like having treatments that work, people don't wanna be addicted to drugs that don't help them get better. And if they knew there was another option and if therapies were illegal that were actually effective to help people recover. And I mean, when psychedelics first became a, a thing and they were experimented on to some extent and quickly um, became illegal. And so like the potential for them to actually be used in a therapeutic setting um, was kind of squashed, I think in the sixties. So I think it was, you know, maybe too much too soon and it wasn't something that could easily be regulated and the government put on the brakes big time. And so now I think we're kind of coming back around in a more controlled setting, hopefully, to make it so that it can actually be looked at as something that could be really beneficial for people to heal. You know, and I, I think at some point, you know, we just don't, people don't wanna be debilitated and hooked on pharmaceuticals that I think, you know, from being, seeing people like on, um, you know, there's plenty of benefit for people that need, need um, pharmaceuticals. And I, I don't discount that. But at the same time, I think a lot of people would prefer or love to try another option. And a lot of pharmaceuticals are strong. I mean, just as strong. You know, it's like someone on gabapentin or Zoloft or Prozac. It's like these are strong drugs. Um, and so that, you know, people are allowed to medicate with those and drive around. Or I mean, and yeah, I mean, people are out there taking drugs all the time. And those aren't necessarily helpful. And sometimes, sometimes they are. But yeah, I think that kind of, we need something helpful <laughs> in a different way. Right, right. I mean, we've also been talking a lot lately about how to prevent human extinction. And I think <laughs> kind of if we're gonna do that, we need a pretty significant shift in the average human consciousness and overly restricting tools that might facilitate that doesn't necessarily seem conducive to our continued survival. Right, yeah. Um, I don't, can I can I just broach another topic here um, mm. regarding uh, you know sort of sacred plants for Native Americans because that that was actually something we got stuck on and is is a very contentious issue 
Uh, mm -hmm. So I know this is a little tangential to what we're talking about, but I'm more or less speaking to people who might want to decriminalize in, in their city. Um, so discussion of peyote is a very um, prickly topic, no pun intended. Um, that 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 is already peyote is already decriminalized and actually legal for you know the First Nations and and the and the uh, the Native Native American folks. So they were pretty upset when they saw that we were uh, going to be decriminalizing because they fought for they fought hard and long for many years uh, to get that decriminalized and that that is their their sacred uh, uh, sacrament and. Um, so for anyone who is working on further you know, decriminalization, the only thing we can do to sort of uh, pay honor to, to their work is to just not mention, not mention peyote in the, in the measure, literally don't mention it at all. All you have to say is mescaline. Mescaline is of course the active, um, the, the, the active component of, of peyote. So there's really no reason to mention peyote. Uh, it just, it just, you know, it's just, it's the best, it's the most we can do to respect, uh, you know, what they came up with as, as in their sovereign nations around, around the country. Basically so, what you're saying is that if they bring that up and they're, they're actually drawing attention, unwanted attention towards the Native Americans and it may cause a problem for them. Yeah. Okay, so, I, I get that then. Yeah. And so Native Americans, many of these folks that I worked with um, would actually like to recriminalize it. So that's a really contentious matter because especially with the folks at uh, decriminalize nature USA which I'm, I'm gonna actually put um, I'm putting a link in this I, I don't know if you have show notes but I put in the, the zoom chat something that you might want to add to your show notes if you do indeed have those um, I'm realizing people are not seeing that who are watching the, the podcast from from what I understand so yeah they would actually have it recriminalized and you logically that's something that that I struggle with and a few other people struggle with because it is a plant and it is, you can grow peyote in your backyard. Uh, so, you know, why do, do they want, want to recriminalize it? I don't understand. Uh, yeah, exactly. So they, they worked hard. Well, here's a, here's a good, here's a good reason. They are, especially in like Arizona, they have, uh, they've grown peyote and peyote buttons take 10 to 12 years to come to fruition. So it's very difficult to get them to the point where they are used in, in a ceremony. And what's been happening is there's a black market for peyote where these kind of, um, I forget what the, the Spanish term for it is, but they're, they're basically people who come and jump the fences and they steal these peyote plants right at the point of fruition and then they sell them on the black market. So that's what that's a large part of what you know the first nations and you know native americans are are concerned about um uh is the, the the unlawful harvesting of their of their plants and it goes on and on but i don't understand how recriminalizing it is going to make that any better that's not going to change anything exactly and that um you're you know i tend to agree with you and if you talk to you know um the founders uh and let me mention their names because these are the guys that these, these are the guys that got this going. It's um, Carlos Plazola, and uh, and Larry. Um, hang on a second. Sorry, I have to I have to look up his name. Um, darn it! I hate I hate to do uh, Larry Norris from Decriminalize Oakland. They're the two folks who who really pushed this through, and and so they would make the same argument that you're that you're making that there really is no logical reason that we should continue to have peyote unmentioned and 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 further to recriminalize it um in in santa cruz we took a sort of uh different once we had passed the measure it had mention of peyote and we actually asked the city council to remove that mention but it got through because in the redlining process they brought back some of the original terminology that we had deleted so they had to go a year later the city council had to go in and sort of remove the word peyote uh, from the measure. So that was our best effort at at not mentioning it and not allowing it to become one of the topics. Uh, and that, that was purely for the request of, of the Native Americans that we were in touch with. So, you know, it's better just to say mescaline and you can reference uh, the San Pedro plant uh, or the San Pedro cactus. You can also mention um, 
uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the names of some of these other ones, but they, uh, they have... The torch cactus? Oh, uh, some kind of... Never yeah, mind. I actually have one of these cactus on my on my on my patio. So I mean, these are things that people have. These are these are <laughs> cacti that people have on their patio all around my condo complex. And everywhere you look, you'll see like you know the San Pedro and the uh, Peruvian torch. That's actually the the one I was looking. For. Was that the one you were thinking of, Ariel? Yeah, the Peruvian torch, which is a, a beautiful uh, cactus. You can basically just cut out a piece of it, boil it and drink it and you can have the same experience i'm told i haven't tried it myself but uh i'm told you can have the same experience that you have on peyote which is you know a 14 hour ordeal as some as some people explain it <laughs> wow yeah so but but a, a lot of it's very uplifting and uh so that's anyway like i said no pun but that's it's a prickly topic and um and so i you know i would urge everyone to just really study what was going on around that and don't you know don't just talk to larry and carlos um even though you know they have a very firm standing on where they fall on this matter uh it might be worth just generally looking at the side of the native american folks uh and just make sure that you understand their current in, in fact make contact with them um i think it's called nih i can put that in the in the show notes too um but, but there's a, a specific group that represents the at least a portion of the north uh the the native american folks i think it's called the native american church yeah i'm sorry that's what it is nac native american church um and you know, definitely talk to them get them on a zoom i mean it might be a good topic for 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 this very podcast um mm -hmm. because you know we should hear their side of it as well this sounds like a fascinating microcosm of uh, the democratic party as far as i'm concerned you have conservatives on one hand who are totally against whatever it is they're against. They, it, they're agree, in agreement. We don't want this, and we're not going to have it. And then you have the liberals on the other hand who say, "Yeah, we really like this," but you have so many factions in the liberals that are fighting each other. You can't get shit done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm trying to imagine somebody bringing this to Las Vegas City Council, or uh, as, as they're called the uh, confederacy of dunsons <laughs> like <Yes>. no <laughs> but maybe i mean you know maybe dirk and john can do it would be getting like that's not getting anywhere so i v vegas um when i was on the 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 meet so we have um monthly meetings with decriminalized nature um, monthly zoom meetings and we actually get most of the folks who are in who are actively lobbying their city council to to decriminalize and so you know in some cases we've had upwards of 100 people on there i'd say there's probably last i checked 45 to 50 cities that are that are have this in motion and i believe las vegas was one i think there's a contingent there um you know not not to go off on yet another topic but it's interesting to note that what they did in portland was very different so if you look at, uh, and here's another item I'll ask you to add to your show notes um, from Leafly, it shows where psychedelics were either decriminalized or legalized. And Oregon did it very differently. They actually uh, started out as part of our decriminalized nature, but they decided to go towards full legalization for therapeutic use. And that's actually how they passed it. Um, so that link that I put, which is to leafly.com, um, it's really interesting to look at what Oregon is, so other people might want to consider the Oregonian technique for decriminalization uh, instead of the decriminalized nature. I don't know, I mean, decriminalized nature, that mechanism has worked for many cities. It might be the easiest route, but yeah. there could be other ways to do this. Uh, so what has to constitute for medicinal use as far as Oregon's? Do you know offhand? That's a really, that's a great question. Um, it does have to be, you do, my understanding is you do have to have like a certified uh, counselor who, you know, has, has a specific degree and who can work with. So in that respect, a lot of people are like, well, what we want to do is have this decriminalized for everybody. So that their, their measure 110, I believe it is, sorry, uh, I'm looking at it right now. Measure 109. Um, specifically for uh, ser psilocybin service facilitators. So you have to be under the supervision of a licensed 
psilocybin, psilocybin surface facilitator. Um, so yeah, that's where that falls. And so that's a contentious issue too. Um, a lot of people just want this to be available to the common individual for growing, harvesting, and also exchanging amongst amongst people. So for instance, if I were to grow psilocybin mushrooms in the decriminalization situation, I should be able to gift it to whoever I want in whatever quantities I want. And so that's, I think, more where the decriminalized nature USA group is is pushing. So it's just worth uh, it's worth understanding that Oregon did it very differently than all the rest of the cities that have passed this. Thanks. So exciting. <clears throat> yeah, I really, I kind of wonder, I think maybe, I don't know, five or 10 years ago, I started just seeing more, like, more, I don't even know what to call it, more instances of people on TV, like on normal television programming, like going to Peru and taking ayahuasca or, tra you know, just traveling around the world and participating in traditional plant plant ceremonies with people and kind of like documenting that on, on TV. And with um, the fantastic fungi movie that Paul Stamets yeah. made, that was just really inspiring and beautiful. Um, and then this Michael Pollan series, Changing Your Mind. Um, I just feel like, I, I think, there is something amazing about it just being in the public eye a little bit more where people can kind of look at this thing that might have been kind of like, ooh, we don't know anything about that or we've never heard about that at all. Um, and just kind of getting it into common public knowledge that this is this is an option, this is something people have done. And with um, indigenous and First Nations peoples, it's like they've been using this for healing for as long as maybe they know. Yeah. Um, and it's really beautiful. And in the same regard, I'd have to say too, it's like, um, I know with, with Iboga in uh, Africa, where it comes from natively, as well as ayahuasca, and I think peyote, that it's um, it's being harvested in an unsustainable way, potentially, as people find out about it more. Right. And that really, you know, if you are gonna try to acquire this for your own personal experimentation purposes in a city where it's decriminalized, that, um, try to find ethical sources. Um, and yeah. so, because it, it is something that if we all try to go do it all at once, like we might destroy the very um, environments and cultures where it comes from. Right. Uh, yeah, we same... might stoke the black market, which is, that's what we really want to avoid. And that's what First yeah. Nations folks want to avoid, so. At the same time, I do hope that it being more in the public eye, I mean, it, there was even some like football quarterback recently who was talking about using ayahuasca, I think. And but I, I'm hoping that that the best quarterback ever that won the Super Bowl, like him, yeah, yeah. There was a, <laughs> but yeah, I do hope that that increased awareness and much. willingness to. He um, took he took ayahuasca. He went to Peru and participated in the ayahuasca ceremony. And credit it with the best season of his life. But he wasn't like on um, something no. during the Super Bowl. No. So far no. as we know. <laughs> but, uh, no, but I do hope that that increased awareness and communication and willingness to discuss things will lead ultimately to a greater understanding of the potential consequences as far as ethically harvesting, as far as, you know, uh, caring about the frogs and toads. Um, I, I can't help but think of like the drug education in China is pretty much, drugs are bad. If you do drugs, you're bad. Yeah. And there's no understanding whatsoever of gradation. So generally when people do drugs, if they do, they'll often just go for the worst thing that they possibly could right off the bat because there's no understanding that, you know, pot and heroin are massively different. And so I think that yeah, I like the notion that increased openness on these topics will lead to healthier usage, um, both for individuals and for the planet and for the communities from which these uh, traditions come. Well, on the, on the point of the ayahuasca, I mean, one of the reasons that I was inclined to, uh, to, to bring the decriminalization, it took nine months of pretty hard work to push that through city council. I was working on it pretty much every day, emails, you know, going and meeting in person. I had to meet with the chief of police. I had to meet with the, um, the health council here. And it was, and then also there, it was open to public debate. So a lot of people were, you know, making, creating these kind of straw man um, uh, 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 arguments against us saying, well, you know, what's next? Once we decriminalize it, we're going to have, 
you know, mushrooms in the vending machines at the middle schools and like, you know, putting it, putting it these ayahuasca in the drinking water. <laughs> but on oh, the ayahuasca right. topic, you know, there was actually an ayahuasca session or I did a, you know, a three day ceremony of ayahuasca and it was actually that, 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 you know, sort of, sort of um, inspired me to begin this process. And of course I didn't do it alone. There were, eventually there were at least 36 people uh, that were that were involved and most of them were UCSC students and they just those guys have a lot of energy and they did incredible amount um, to make this happen too. It wasn't just me. Um, but but you know I had such a tremendous experience on the ayahuasca and also with the the toad medicine which is the 5-MeO DMT um, that you know if I feel like anyone who wants to do that should not have to go to Peru or should not have to go to Mexico to experience this, why not just be able to do it in our backyard here? And so, uh, and so now we can. And so now, you know, you don't have to have a shaman who is, you know, legally able to carry the ayahuasca in order to to do. I mean, I think you should, but you know, you could also have a facilitator who understands the aya and can make this happen right in our own city. And I think you're going to start to see kind of backyard uh, ayahuasca sessions, which could be a good thing. Yeah, I think, I mean, unmentionable, but I definitely know people who have taken it upon themselves to kind of have their own ceremonies with themselves. Um, and I think um, for a resource, and, and it's been really healing and helpful for them. I think also it can be, you know, it's, these are like medicines that um, are very strong and need to be, I think, done in a good setting. And there's a lot of information out there, I think, to help people. But one of my close friends and colleagues, Jim Fadiman, um, oh, yeah. is kind of, yeah, he's yeah. just a lovely person, but he's right, wrote a book uh, called The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide that yeah. has really good yeah. protocols for like, if you want to have one of these experiences, how to create the right environment so that it can be um, hopefully positive. Um, and he also um, is a big proponent for microdosing, which is sort of taking a small, almost imperceptible dose regularly. Um, and they've they have a very long, like, ongoing study about this that is just personal accounts. But I think they have over a hundred thousand personal accounts that have been reported to him at this point that they're logging of people having um, really transformational experiences with a variety of health problems, and they can't exactly figure out what the mechanism is or why. But it's helping people with like chronic pain, uh, MS, bladder issues, depression, like a variety of things seem to be kind of getting better. And this is taking like a low dose of uh, psilocybin or any other kind of, maybe I think LSD also is possible and um, and psilocybin is part of this decriminalization effort. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, that there's so many people that have reported good success with this at this point and it's not something that will change your mental state very much, but it can kind of, seems like the repetitive procedure, of the microdosing protocol, which I think he's published. I mean, I can also link it in the show notes um, that it can be really helpful for people to, to kind of transform their lives in a slow, manageable way that's easy to integrate. And also to like, to read up on, I think he's also in one of Michael Pollan's Change Your Mind Netflix moments talking about oh, cool. it. Yeah, but it's kind of, it's really exciting in, in our community here in Santa Cruz and in the Bay Area. There's a lot of, I think a lot of hope and a lot of people that have done experiments on themselves as well and are inspired, really like inspired because they've found, um, they found healing and they've found, they found something really beautiful about themselves maybe in their connection to others that have pushed people to want to help make this more available for more people. Right. And then I've heard of like engineers and, um, and people who are creative also using microdosing and saying that, you know, microdosing of psilocybin uh, to say that that, that, that was, or, or their experience was that it helped them think slightly differently in a larger, maybe a little bit more out of the box uh, in the case of the engineers. And it, it, it brought more creativity to people who are in that kind of field. Well, I mean, there's a reason why pretty much all of Silicon Valley doesn't drug test because they, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to remember what company it was that basically said like they, <laughs> that they wanted the best and the brightest and that drug testing tended to weed out the best and the brightest. <laughs> Yeah, I've never been drug tested, and I don't think I would work for a company that, that required that. We, we <laughs> had a, um, a large electrical contractor here in, in Vegas a couple of years back that, same thing, they had to stop 
drug testing because they couldn't get anybody that was qualified. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe city council should start drug testing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Well, or mandatorily sure microdosing. <laughs> say I again, think some people in no, I'm sorry, just fat <laughs> joke. So, so for those of us who don't know anything about drugs, could you explain uh, microdosing? Um, I, yes, for those of us who don't really know about drugs. <laughs> I mean, I was on the D.A.R.E. show back in the day, so I should know all about drugs. <laughs> so I think, I, I think John doesn't know anything. <laughs> I know nothing. <laughs> He's clearly our oldest novice. <laughs> so, uh, um, so I, I just thought the there are a lot of people out there that John. just have no idea what microdosing is, okay. why, why you would do it, and the benefits. So I think that um, really like the jury and the research are still out for the exact clear benefits, but what they've seen at this point is that it seems to have a benefit for a variety of things, um, kind of like a broad sweeping benefit. And what microdosing is, is taking a subtle and almost imperceptible dose. And I think for different people, that dose is different on a schedule of at least a month and one day on and two days off. And I, and I think that um, Paul Stamets has a protocol about this as well as Jim Fadiman. It's called the Fadiman Protocol. And I think they both have slightly different ideas about what, um, and we can link this in the notes too, about what is the you know, most effective but it's kind of the idea that you take it for one day and then you take a break and then you take it another day and then take a little break and you alternate back and forth. And the dosage, I think, is usually around a tenth of a full dose. And based on really like, like your body weight and your tolerance and your liver metabolism, that could be very different per person. And so I think with like psilocybin, I think it's anywhere between like uh, 0.1 to 0.25 grams. Um, or, you know, 100 to 250 micrograms. And I think that depending on the person, I think you kind of want to dial it in to be the right amount where you don't feel it. Like, so where it's not, you don't feel altered, where you feel like you can go about your day, you could go to work, um, because it's doing something kind of on the subtle level to shift your body and things that we know about entheogenic plants and herbs, as well as, um, um, you know, mind altering medicines is that they have an ability to help the body adapt. And so with psilocybin, I think, I think it's working on some level on the, on the brain. And I mean, different mushrooms are, are really like a blessing. You know, there's mushrooms that can help regrow the nephrons in your kidneys called cordyceps. cordyceps. Wow. Um, lion's mane can help your brain, like regenerate um, nerve cells in your brain um, and in the nerve endings. So I think Paul Stamets recommends mixing lion's mane with niacin to push, push it to the tips of your nerve endings with like diabetic neuropathy. And I mean, there's so many different uses for entheogenic plants, but with psychedelic ente entheogenic plants, I mean, adaptogenic plants, um, the idea is it's kind of helping your body adapt and it's helping connect things that might need, need to be connected. And I think it's, so, I mean, it's very subtle and it's hard to know exactly what's happening at this point in research, but it seems to be beneficial for many people that have reported. And yeah, that's kind of the tip of the iceberg for what I know about it. Had, um, has there been think, any, any studies with uh, like Parkinson's and dementia or Alzheimer's or anything like that with, uh, that you know of? You know, I, you know, I sh I, I'll talk to Jim about this more in detail, but the, the amount of, information that they're collecting from personal accounts of people exp exploring this. And it's like, you know, it's not, it's not random weird people. It's like normal people, right. like doctors, lawyers, people that are trying to improve their lives and aren't doing well and have heard about this and they want to try something. They need something that will help. And so um, it's quite a lot of normal people. And I think within that group, there probably are people that have suffered from dementia or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's that have explored this. And I'm not sure what their experience has been, but I can uh, check on that and see if there are, at this point, it's like a large personal study of individual accounts, but a, a large body of information. 
Yeah, it looks like lion's mane. Some people think that lion's mane uh, may help with biological markers of Alzheimer's. It says preclinical studies suggest that lion's mane may reduce inflammation and biological markers of Alzheimer's, improve cognition, and increase the release of nerve growth factor, a protein that increases the length of nerve cell processes. So, um, you know, the, 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 on this topic, though, uh, I've seen people get, uh, you know, buying the preformed pills that are that have the uh, the psilocybin in it and i gotta say it's like it's really i think it's worthwhile to to create your you know to build your own you just get a little a tiny little i don't know if this can be seen but it's just a little you know 20 dollar pack by fusi f-o-o-s-i and uh, i mean there's other makers but it basically has these little tools that allow you to pack the 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 um the the the, the, the empty pill with the psilocybin matter uh and then you know what i've seen though is like people are getting 0.1 i think you said 0.1 or 0.2 of a gram is about the right for most people to do a microdose an imperceptible amount but what i've seen is people are getting sort of sort of ripped off because they they're getting this 0.1 and it, the pill looks like it's full but it might have lion's mane or just some inactive other dust in there um and so people are paying like extraordinary amounts for, I would say like 10 times more for this amount of psilocybin. Whereas if you just, if you just obtain the psilocybin mushroom yourself and put it in a coffee grinder and then packed it yourself, it, it's very inexpensive to do, very inexpensive. I, I'm a proponent of that. And I think too, like mixing it for yourself, like I'm, a, I'm an herbalist, but I do feel like there's an incredible benefit that can be had by combining um, combining plants for health for other reasons with, you know, it's kind of, they can have a synergistic effect. And so if you know an herbalist or are an herbalist or want to do your own research, it can be really beneficial to combine um, fungi and adaptogenic plants and herbs to create like a full body, mind and spirit like medicine. Um, yeah. And I think too, a lot of people don't realize with mushrooms, like with anything fresh, it degrades with exposure to heat and ex it degrades with exposure to moisture content. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you're not getting something that's more fresh, if you're getting something that's out on a shelf or been exposed to heat or moisture, that the strength of it might be very vastly different um, and, and how it was like produced and dried. And there's a lot of inconsistency potentially with, you know, with the strength. And so it's always good to kind of like test a very small amount because there might be a lot of variation. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, I think one thing we we didn't really touch on is uh, is I mean we talked about ayahuasca and the active the active chemical I guess in there um, is DMT, which mm. specifically and DMT. So would you guys be open to talking about the DMT at all? Please. Sure, <laughs> this is a great chat. Yeah, we've got yeah, five minutes. Just yeah, we have some more minutes. So. Excellent. Um, so D N N D M T. Uh, that's that letter N as in November, N and DMT, is um, uh, usually extracted from the Hermosa hostilis plant. And it's just a, it's a tree that has bark and they, they would basically use some, some sort of extraction process to get just the DMT out of it. And, you know, it's, it's very, it's, that is technically decriminalized in all of these uh, cities that did the entheogen, entheogenic decriminalization. Not the case for Denver, but all of these other folks that are listed in that link I sent from Leafly in the chat. Um, but typically, uh, DMT, is, I think it's considered the strongest psychedelic in the world, and um, I can sort of vouch for that. It's sorry, uh, it is or isn't legal it, it in Denver? Is, it's a, uh, it, no, sorry. So in Denver, they only decriminalized psilocybin mushrooms, so they didn't effectively decriminalize any any of this other. So I think that's how places like Oakland and Santa Cruz sort of stand out uh, against the, or, or are differentiated from, from Denver. So maybe Denver will, will pull off the rest of the entheogens, but um, personally, I know, that, I, I know that this, like this election cycle, we're voting on uh, legalizing the mushrooms, but I don't think anything else, like, right now it's just decriminalized, but I don't think anything else is on that. that is that in yeah. Nevada? No, uh, Denver. Oh, in Denver. Colorado. Whatever. She's in Denver. <laughs> or nearby, you know, in an undisclosed location. Yes. <laughs> um, 
but anyway, the, you know, the, the DMT thing is like, it, you know, in the past, a lot of times people would use it at, at raves. Like, you know, there's, people were using it at, you know, let's say music festivals. And I really think that's an unfortunate way to initially be introduced to it because it's so powerful and it's so profound. And I would argue, you know, a little bit of a spiritual experience. Um, if people are going to use NNDMT, I really feel like there's, it should be considered a little bit like using ayahuasca because in, in that you want to hold space, you want to be in a quiet environment, at least the first couple of times you try it. Um, you know, you want to have somebody who's absolutely holding space for you so that there's not a bunch of people talking and, and otherwise interfering with the profound experience that you're having. So this might be a great, this might be a great thing to try, like in a meadow where there, you know that there's nobody else, or it might be a great thing to try, you know, in your living room on a Sunday morning, where you have control of what's coming and going and what sounds are out there. Um, because, you know, making sure that first couple trips that you have on DMT are about you and about your, you know, your psychedelic journey. Um, Cause I think it can be really healing personally. And uh, so I know people who, you know, walked others through DMT experience to, to great success. Um, and then, you know, you, you end up with this beautiful relationship with that plant um, versus sure. having potentially a terrifying relationship with the plant. Just to emphasize that there are many spirits. So the DMT is constantly produced by the pineal gland in the center of the brain, pretty much, which is also um, in Taoist medicine considered to be uh, the crystal chamber or the palace of the mud pill, the, the center of the nine chambers that comprise the upper energetic centers of the body. And so in spiritual practice, that location will often be energized and linked to the senses to basically open up the energetic perceptions for all sorts of spiritual work and Taoist cave meditation will basically have one sitting in the dark um, for weeks on end uh, often eating DMT rich or, or tryptamine tryptophan rich foods which ultimately flood the system with DMT to open up the energetic perceptions this is also um, found it's in increased levels during birth and death, so potentially responsible for the experience that people have when they die or near-death experiences. And uh, I've also heard during lucid dreaming. So it's hmm. there are very few instances. It's always being produced by this spiritual center of your brain, but it's it's only under extremely rare circumstances that its levels in your system increase, either through birth, death, cave meditation, or exogenous intake. Well, uh, there's like an in, there's an inhibitor that right, runs, they, that runs side by side with it in your body, and so while the inhibitor is present, it's sometimes yeah, hard to feel which hard is, to feel the DMT, and so during birth and death, the inhibitor drops down, and you feel it. So that's why ayahuasca is composed of two plants, one of which is, contains the DMT, the other of which contains the MAOI, which prevents it being uh, degraded. Right. But, uh, but yeah, so just to highlight that it is, um, yeah, for many, some call it the spirit molecule. For many, it's a very profound substance that I would also say deserves a fair bit of reverence, um, though it is often, you know, Many take a more recreational and uh, casual approach to it. Yeah, I link, I'm, gonna, I'm linking the, the Spirit Molecule, the book uh, by Rick Strassman called DMT, The Spirit Molecule. I'm linking that since you brought it up, which is one of my favorite books. It's it's wonderful. And the studies he did, he was the only, he's been the only person legally allowed by the FDA to, to research it. And he researched it with intravenous DMT back in the 90s. And it's, it's totally fascinating. You guys are actually bringing up one of the biggest reasons that nobody wants this to be done because the t the two biggest people that are going to be against the two biggest lobbies are going to be the church and pharmaceuticals. They don't want this stuff to come out. They don't want you to be your own person. They don't want you to explore yourself and become a better person through your own means and methods. They don't like it. This is one of the reasons why we have fucking drug war, which I think is one of the biggest scourges on humanity that we could have ever come up with. It's like a world war. The drug war is, is absolutely fucking ridiculous. And people get so brainwashed over this stuff. They're told over and over again by the church and by the government and by pharmaceuticals that this stuff is not good for you. But they 
are also telling you at the same time, oh, but the stuff that we give you is the stuff that you should use, even though they've shown that it's detrimental to your physical and your mental health. So I just find it really fascinating how we can be so brainwashed by the government and by the church for stuff that's good for us to go for things that are bad for us and we, we can't figure it out. Well, it makes a lot of sense, I think, if you're someone in a position of power or holding power over people and that power is getting you um, control and money, <clears throat> where it's like you want to be the person holding the, the bag. Um, that people need to get this stuff from. And so it's like, you know, if the church has a monopoly on dishing out God and pharmaceuticals have a monopoly on dishing out feeling better, then all of a sudden, if you can have something that you could grow and you could grow yourself or you could, you know, you could acquire easily that nature made for free um, that could actually help you have a personal direct relationship with your own, with your own sense of God and what that is. And I think having a, a connection with the divine in whatever way that looks to you is something that people have as a common experience when they ingest entheogens. And so I, it's I like all of a sudden, agree. yeah, when no one can, no one, own, no, no one's dishing that out to you at that point, you're, you're kind of connecting with it on your own and it's incredibly empowering, but it, which is, I think, really beautiful. I, mean, I agree with you, yeah. absolutely. And that's, that's why it's so, it's so mind boggling to me that when you, there are actually studies from both sides that come out and basically say the same thing. So if you do any kind of research on your own, you're going to know that. But people aren't even willing to do that. And, you know, it's like, like you look in the Bible and the Bible says that Jesus said that all God is, is within all of us. All you have to do is read the Bible and you can see that stuff there. And yet we allow the church to tell us, no, nah, you got to come through us to get to that. So th that's why I get so annoyed about all this stuff is because the research is there, it's right there in front of your face, but you're still letting the government or the church tell you, oh, no, 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 don't listen to that. They, they didn't really mean that. What they really mean is what we're telling you. Well, I think it's a great hope that like people who have had this experience and are so inspired that and believe in it as a way that we can all move forward together with a healthier society, family, community, individual um, that people are trying to push this um, decriminalization through in their city councils and it seems like it's not that difficult and that I think when you have an experience that is a peak experience of something absolutely inspiring and beautiful and healing you want to share that with other people and you want people to be able to access it and I think that's kind of the driving force behind this and I think it's a force for good <laughs> and it seems like it's maybe finally moving in a an upward positive direction so totally agree rachel i think that's really well said yeah, i'm gonna sorry i just want to say that my life is dependent on pharmaceuticals I <laughs> I know. It, but i also think that we should be able to have whatever we want thanks totally. they, they have a place they do uh, yep well hey guys we're out of time again so um i thank everybody and um I just want to say we're all in this together, so let's unify our defecation, hey? <laughs> Get our shit together. Please, <laughs> That's um, a great ending. <laughs> <laughs> refrain from killing anyone. I'd appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't kill any reporters. Okay. Or just anyone in general. <laughs> yeah, respect for all, all beings. Yeah. Seriously. Thanks again. This is a good show. I'm just so honored that you could join us, and thank you for your work. Thank you, Antonia. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And you know, likewise, thanks, Dirk. Just want to shout out for you know what you're saying is is resonates with me a lot. So thank you for your your perspectives. All right, all right, gang. I know we got to go. All right. Thanks, guys. See you, later. See you next week. See y'all later. <laughs>